J. Robert Oppenheimer was celebrated as a national hero after helping create the atomic bomb, which played a significant role in ending World War II. However, his perspective changed when he began questioning the future use of such powerful weapons. Unfortunately, he faced challenges as certain individuals, like Louis Strauss, worked to discredit him and damage his reputation through investigations. Spoilers ahead. In Christopher Nolan's new film Oppenheimer, we saw how Louis Strauss, portrayed by the talented Robert Downey Jr., played a crucial role in undermining Oppenheimer's standing in society. Despite his initial claim, Oppenheimer's dissenting views on nuclear weapons led to a difficult and controversial journey for the renowned scientist. Today, we'll look deeper into the life of this controversial figure and cover all the details of what the movie had actually missed. The Early Life of Louis Strauss Louis Strauss was born in Charleston, West Virginia. His mom and dad were Rosa and Louis Strauss. They were successful in selling shoes. Louis's grandparents came from Germany and Austria and came to the U.S. in the 1830s and 1840s. They made their home in Virginia. Strauss wanted to learn physics, but a recession in 1913 hurt his dad's business and he couldn't pay for his college. Strauss helped Herbert Hoover, who was the U.S. president from 1929 to 1933, with relief work during and after World War I. In the 1920s and 1930s, he worked as an investment banker at Kuhn, Loeb & Company, making a lot of money and becoming a millionaire through his own efforts. After Strauss's mom passed away from cancer, he started the Louis and Rosa Strauss Memorial Fund to support radium treatment. Through this, he met physicist Leo Zillard, who wrote to him about the Han Strassmann paper on fission's discovery, hoping for funding for his research. During World War II, Strauss joined the Navy's Department of Ordnance to help make weapons. In 1946, President Truman chose him to be part of the new Atomic Energy Commission. He later became the commissioner of the AEC. When the Soviets tested their first atomic bomb in 1949, Strauss supported making more powerful weapons known as thermonuclear weapons. Strauss plays a significant role for the U.S. hydrogen bomb development. As the United States was no longer the only superpower, Strauss supported developing a much more powerful hydrogen bomb. However, J. Robert Oppenheimer strongly opposed the idea. Oppenheimer believed the hydrogen bomb would worsen the Cold War arms race and called for more transparency about America's nuclear weapons. But Strauss disagreed, fearing it would benefit the Soviets. Strauss convinced Truman to pursue the hydrogen bomb, and it was announced in 1950. The U.S. testing the first H-bomb in less than three years, and the Soviets followed soon after. After leaving the AEC in 1950, Strauss returned to government when President Eisenhower appointed him as an atomic energy advisor. He held significant power as all federal agencies had to clear their atomic activities with him. Later, Eisenhower asked Strauss to chair the AEC, but Strauss agreed only if Oppenheimer was no longer involved with the commission. Why did he despise Robert? In the black and white scenes of Oppenheimer, there's a Senate hearing where Louis Strauss accuses J. Robert Oppenheimer of ruining his reputation. Strauss feels humiliated by Oppenheimer, not just once, but many times, even in his dreams. This humiliation becomes Strauss's worst fear, and he seeks revenge. But revenge doesn't follow reason. It makes him think he can't find peace until he destroys Oppenheimer completely. Strauss first met Oppenheimer in 1947. He'd worked hard and become the commissioner of the Atomic Energy Commission. When he saw Robert getting out of the car, he rushed towards him with excitement, like a child. Perhaps, like many Americans, Strauss also admired the man who helped end World War II. But they say it's best not to meet our heroes, because in the end, we might start disliking them. After the war, Strauss and other board members thought Robert should become a leader of Princeton University. Oppenheimer asked Strauss a simple question, did you study physics formally? History tells us that he wanted to, but circumstances didn't allow it. 
His family's business suffered through the 1913 recession, and Strauss had to give up his dream to sell shoes with his father. Though things got better later on, the dream of studying physics still lingered. When Robert asked that innocent question, Strauss's expression changed. He tried to defend himself or show his worth by saying he was a successful shoe seller. But heroes can be very self-centered. Oppenheimer quickly called Albert Einstein a forgotten genius, so it's doubtful he would have much respect for a shoe salesman. This was the first serious blow and humiliation that Strauss experienced from Oppenheimer. As humans, we tend to find reasons to dislike someone if we look for those reasons eagerly. And even if we can't find any reasons, we just might make some up ourselves. In the next scene, Oppenheimer approached the brilliant Einstein by the pond and they had a conversation. We didn't hear what they talked about because we were seeing things from Strauss's perspective. However, what we saw was Einstein walking away with a grumpy face. When Strauss tried to greet him, Einstein ignored him as if he didn't exist. It must have hurt to be rejected by one of the greatest scientists of their time, especially after being put down by the most famous scientist in the country. Louis Strauss was an ambitious and hardworking man, but his own insecurities caused his downfall. After the war, Oppenheimer became very opinionated and didn't care much about the powerful people in Washington. Strauss thought Robert saw himself as a god and wasn't patient with regular people. The first humiliating incident made Strauss lose respect for Robert, and the second one felt like a declaration of war. Robert disagreed with Strauss's export policy on isotopes and publicly mocked him during an official AEC meeting. He made Strauss feel like an amateur physicist who didn't know much about the subject. This offended Strauss and he wanted revenge. He waited for the right time to strike and when the moment came, he took action. Robert had humiliated Strauss twice already. Ambitious and feeling insecure, Strauss didn't want history to repeat itself. They disagreed on developing the hydrogen bomb. To get Oppenheimer out of the way, Strauss devised a plan to portray him as a traitor to the country. The urgency to stay ahead in the nuclear arms race with the Soviets pushed the U.S. to develop the H-bomb, which Oppenheimer opposed. He believed the A-bomb was made to end the war and didn't see a real reason for another powerful bomb. On the contrary, Strauss, motivated to serve his country and impress his superiors, eagerly fought for the H-bomb project. Between 1947 and 1953, Oppenheimer made enemies in the government because he spoke honestly and didn't sugarcoat things like Strauss did. He shared what he truly believed in, but some people didn't want to hear the truth. They only wanted to hear what fit their own political views, and Strauss was skilled at twisting the truth. He presented evidence against Oppenheimer cleverly, so nobody would know he was behind Oppenheimer's downfall. Strauss gave Oppenheimer's FBI file to William Borden, who also didn't like Oppenheimer because they disagreed on things. During the Cold War with the Soviets, U.S. policies against communists became harsh, and Strauss knew how to use them against his biggest enemy, Oppenheimer. He had Borden write a letter to the FBI accusing Oppenheimer of being a spy for Russia. The tense political climate made the investigation inevitable, and a biased bureaucratic hearing was held to decide Oppenheimer's security clearance. Even though Einstein advised him not to fight a losing battle, Oppenheimer, being an ethical man who believed he did nothing wrong, wanted to prove his innocence. He fought hard, but the government officials not only took away his security clearance, but also ruined his reputation in the media. The public, seeing their hero accused of supporting communists, turned against him. Sadly, this wasn't the first or the last time such things happened. Sometimes if you keep saying something over and over, you might start believing it's true. Strauss falsely believed that the scientific community in America hated him because of what he did to Robert. He thought Robert had turned them against him, but that wasn't true. The scientists didn't like him because they felt he was too focused on himself and his opinions. They wanted him out of government positions. In the end, Louis Strauss faced the consequences of his actions. The Senate committee turned into basically a trial and accused him of trying to harm Oppenheimer's reputation for personal reasons. Strauss believed that Oppenheimer had said something disrespectful about him to Einstein during their first meeting, but the truth was they didn't even talk about him. 
Maybe Strauss wanted to prove himself or thought he was the center of everything. Could have been Oppenheimer's comment on his family business or Oppenheimer not showing interest in his story or maybe Einstein not acknowledging him when he greeted him hurt his ego. There could be many reasons why an insecure man like Strauss became hostile to Oppenheimer. While Strauss was creating plots in his mind, Oppenheimer was battling his own inner struggles and didn't have time to think about anything else. This may have offended a narcissist like Strauss even more. He wondered why Oppenheimer didn't acknowledge him or compliment him. Strauss made it his life's goal to bring down Oppenheimer. In the end, Strauss faced the consequences of his actions and his nomination to the cabinet was rejected in a way similar to how Oppenheimer was denied his clearance, but in a more public and humiliating manner. It's like karma or poetic justice in the movie. What goes around comes around. There's one thing Louis Strauss said, and we think it's true. He believed that if Oppenheimer had the chance, he would still create the atomic bomb because Oppenheimer was also ambitious and wanted to make a significant impact. However, we believe Oppenheimer wouldn't have agreed to drop it on a city with people after seeing its destructive power. He might have demonstrated its strength to the world, but not to harm anyone. On the other hand, Strauss had no strong moral compass and did everything to satisfy his thirst for revenge.